I feel personally very moved that the people who represent the four most influential Western countries in Nigeria are women. High Commissioner Lang, Ambassador Ori, Ambassador Leonard, and my very dear friend, Ambassador Blackman. I'm very moved by their accomplishment and their presence because for me it is a sign of much needed progress. We have to remember that the reason we're celebrating these women is not because women somehow cannot naturally be ambassadors, but because women have for so long been excluded, and now we slowly are righting the wrongs of history. Remember that women in different parts of the world were not even allowed to vote because they were women. In France, for example, where Ambassador Blackman is from, Women were not allowed to vote until 1944. 1944 is not that long ago. I'm sure there are people here today who were alive in 1944. Representation matters. If we see only one kind of person doing one kind of job over and over again, we start to think that only that kind of person can do that job. And so the presence of these women creates hope for a more equal and just world. And there is nothing more essential to the human spirit than hope. I am equally moved by all the women being celebrated today. I've had the opportunity to learn about them, and I've been filled with admiration for all of their work. I'm inspired by people like Professor Joy Ezilo, who set up WACO to create real change. These women are proof of what many of us know, that women are capable and able, that the gifts of intelligence and courage and initiative and integrity are not gender specific. And yet there's something bittersweet about the celebration that we're having today because the fact that we need an International Women's Day is proof that we do not yet have equality between men and women. And so as we celebrate these women, let us also acknowledge the unique challenges that they face. Every human being who has achieved success has also faced challenges. Every human being has suffered in some way. But women face specific challenges because they're women. It is true that we now tell girls to be ambitious and to reach as high as they can, but it is also true that we resent ambitious women. We resent powerful women. We are less willing to extend grace to powerful women when they fail. We judge powerful women more harshly. And by we, I mean most societies in the world. And so women in leadership positions Women like the women that we're celebrating today have the unique challenge of balancing various things. They have to prove themselves from the start because very often they're not given the assumption of competence that men in the same position are given. Sometimes they have to deal with malign insinuations, suggestions like, is she really qualified? Did she get her position from sleeping with a man? And I remember once somebody complaining that his new female boss was not motherly. Even though, of course, the woman's job description did not include being a mother. And most of all, women in positions of power have to deal with the double standards. And so for the same behavior, a man will be labeled assertive, a woman aggressive. A man will be called strategic, a woman manipulative. A man will be called a leader, a woman controlling. A man would be called self-confident, a woman would be called arrogant. So I am here standing before you as a believer in the full equality of men and women, but I have also taken to asking myself, whether there are times when I judge women more harshly than I judge men in the same circumstances. I want to be more reflective 
I want to question myself more. Because sometimes the things we do seem so normal to us that we are blind to the prejudice at their core. I remember a Nigerian man here in Lagos once telling me, I liked you very much when you were just writing books, but when you started talking about feminism, you became controversial and I no longer liked you. And so I thought, well, the first thing I thought was, has it occurred to this man to wonder whether I like him? And whether I want him, with his kind of reasoning, or lack thereof, to like me. But the larger question, why is it controversial? Feminism is a simple justice movement. And so my conclusion is that the hostility that the subject of feminism sometimes brings up in people is proof of the necessity of feminism. If we did not live in a world that still actively diminishes and excludes women, then talking about equal rights for women would not be remotely controversial. Sometimes I'm called an activist, but I'm actually really not an activist. I think activist is such a, such a noble word, and I think it's, it's a word that should be used for people who actually do activist work, people like Professor Joy Zilu, who's a wackle I'm so impressed by because I was reading about it earlier today. I really prefer to talk about literature and stories and ideas and art. But my literature gave me a platform, and I chose to use that platform to talk about injustice. I've always been interested in questions of justice, and I've always believed that it is important that one take a stand. And for me, part of taking a stand is being more reflective. And so as we celebrate women today, I hope that we can all be more reflective. The women we celebrate today are doing such wonderful work, but we also have a role to play. We also have a role to play towards this journey of gender equality. I think it's also really important not to read things as black and white. It's very easy to dismiss concerns that people have. So when a woman talks about ways in which women have been excluded, often somebody will say to her, what do you have to complain about? A lot of the things that happen in the world are not black and white, they're actually gray. I think almost all of us here have experienced some sort of unpleasant um, thing where we know that we haven't been treated well, and we also know that often those things are subtle. They're not black and white, they're gray. And so one of the things that I think that we can do collectively towards this journey to gender equality is to think more in gray and less in black and white. I once said to a relative that a politician we were talking about was quite misogynistic. And this relative said to me, but he has a wife and daughters. And so that's a very black and white way of thinking. It is, in fact, quite possible to have a wife and daughters whom you love and still think, for example, that a woman should not be governor because she's a woman. It matters how we talk about things. It matters the language we use. And so I know that I'm in the midst of a lot of um, NGO people who use language like um, gender-based violence, and it actually has a very cool GBV. But sometimes I think that language can obfuscate what we really mean. And so when we talk about gender-based violence, it seems to me that it is even more important to be specific that we are in fact talking about male violence against women. We're talking about the fact that all over the world there is an epidemic of men beating, assaulting, killing, raping women. And the language we use matters. It matters that we call things what they really are. How we talk about rape matters. What we praise girls for matters. What we praise boys for matters. The way we react when rape is discussed, and this is something I think is quite common in Nigeria, where often we will leave the subject of the rape and focus on everything else but the rape. Why was she wearing a short skirt? Why was she out at night? The way we raise children matters. When children are there, when their parents are talking about assault and violence against women, children are picking up cues and norms and ways to think about these things. If a rape is being discussed and a father is very firm 
about how wrong this is in every imaginable way, then he's going to raise a son who's also going to feel very firmly that rape is wrong, completely wrong. And then we start a cycle of justice. And that's how we, that's how we change the world, step by step, slowly. When we talk to men about rape, we should not be understanding. So I want to tell you a story about another relative. I won't name, I won't name, I won't be specific, but um, a relative, a woman who was in a physically abusive marriage and there was a family meeting to talk about her husband who was beating her. And an uncle of mine then said that he was going to talk to the husband and he was going to start by telling him, you know, women can be problematic. And sometimes we want to beat them, but just try. And I remember thinking that's not the way to go about it because you don't want to be understanding when you're addressing something that really is a hideous and heinous crime. And so this journey to justice, to gender equality, as all journeys to justice, is multifaceted. And so it was the courage and the sacrifice of black Americans that led to the ending of overt state prejudice in the US, but white Americans helped. It is the courage and sacrifice of women that has brought about the relative progress that we have made, but men need to come on board. Men listen to men. So I hope that more men will join this journey of justice. When women start NGOs to help women who have been raped, men should start NGOs to teach men not to rape. It is not enough to talk about it is not enough to talk about how women suffer sexual assault. We should also talk about the perpetrators of sexual assault. I once praised a, a Nigerian comedian and I told him that a lot of Nigerian comedy is very lazy and a lot of the punchlines are just always misogynistic and so it was quite refreshing to listen to him. And he said to me, I hope you never see any of my early skits because I said terrible things about women. But I really appreciated what he said because I then said to him, we're not looking for perfection, we're looking for progress. And so he had made progress from clearly his misogynistic skits to coming to a place where his comedy did not depend on lazy punchlines about women's inferiority. So men listen to men. We want to create a world where men listen to men and women, but that hasn't happened yet. And so while we're working at it, we need men to step up. And of course, it's impossible not to talk about the gender bill. I was struck by a quote in the Nigerian Guardian about this bill, where somebody who was trying to explain why the bill had failed said that the male legislators did not think that it was relevant. <laughs> I thought this was very amusing, and it made me think about um, a friend of mine who is, uh, who's Dutch, um, and who's a very progressive man and who I think in many ways would consider himself a feminist. And after Michelle Obama's memoir was published, this friend of mine said, oh, I bought Michelle Obama's book for all of my female friends. And I then said to him, but why your female friends? Why, why not for your male friends as well? And he was a bit taken aback. It hadn't occurred to him that it might be a good idea to buy a book by a woman for men. So we know from studies that women read men and women, but men read men. And it means then that men are less likely to be familiar with women's stories, women's concerns, and maybe that is why the male legislators in Nigeria did not think that women's issues were relevant. But they are. Women's issues are human issues and they matter. Another man used culture as a reason for the bill not passing. I think it's time for us to come up with a better argument than culture. Culture does not make people. People make culture. We make and we remake culture. I'm an Igbo woman, and only 
50 years ago in Igbo land, if you gave that to twins, the twins were taken immediately to an evil forest and they were left there to die. When missionaries wanted to change that tradition, many people resisted, and they resisted because it was culture. And now 50 years on, it seems so normal that we celebrate the birth of twins. We make culture, we remake culture. We also have to remember, we also have to remember that in Europe, right after the Second World War, it was completely novel to have women walking outside the home. And now it seems completely normal, which is why we have people like Ambassador Blackman and Ori and all of them. When my mother was born in 1942, she wanted to go to university. Not in 1942, but I mean, she was born in 1942. And, and when she was old enough, to, she wanted to go to university. And everyone thought it was a waste of money. But my mother persevered and she did go to university. And thinking of my mother's story makes me think about all the other women who were fiercely intelligent, but who never got the chance, who did not even dare to dream because they knew that because they had been born women, their dreams would die at birth. I have always felt a kind of nostalgic sadness, thinking of how much humanity has lost because women were excluded. And so when I read about how long it took various countries to admit women into medical schools, I wonder, might we today have the cure for so many of the different cancers that are ravaging us as human beings if we had included women, if we had not excluded the brains and the ideas of half of the world's population for so many centuries? And so in talking again about this gender bill, there are people who have said, well, women should not want quotas. It should all be merit. We should not do affirmative action for women. They should earn it. But the people who make these arguments have to remember that men have had centuries of affirmative action. If you belong to a group that has access to something because another group is excluded from that thing, then it's affirmative action. And so the many men, and I'm sure there are many, many wonderful, um, talented men here, but many of those men, would they have the positions they have if they were not men? I don't think so. And so when we talk about merit, I think it's really important to talk about it in a very nuanced way and to recognize that women were excluded because they were women. And so it only makes sense that they should now be included because they are women. We should no longer, we should no longer, we should no longer feel uncertain or embarrassed about saying that we want a woman to have a position because she's a woman. Obviously, the underlying idea is that she's qualified. But yes, we should want a woman to have a position because she's a woman. Because for so long, we refused women positions because they were women. And so, finally, what is required for good governance? We require people who have integrity, people who will not steal our money, people who will have human-centered policies, people who will not hold on to power desperately for the sake of it. Women have those qualities. Some men also have those qualities. But I hope, I really hope, that celebrations like this don't just end with giving out awards, all of which are lovely, but that they actually also start to bring about real change in our lives, that we become more reflective, that we go back home and think about what we are doing, not just the NGOs, not, the, not just the women who are being celebrated, but what we are doing. What are we praising our sons for? Are we praising our sons when they do domestic work? If we do that, then we're making them think that somehow domestic work is not something that they should do. Are we praising our daughters when they shrink themselves? Are we telling our daughters that marriage is the ultimate thing? Are we telling people in abusive relationships that they should manage? Are we praising women when they have the courage to leave abusive relationships? Those are the ways that we can take very small steps in this journey of gender equality. And I hope that in maybe 50 years, or maybe a hundred years, we will not need to have an International Women's Day. Because really, the goal of feminism is to make itself redundant. 
We want a world of equality. We want a world where women's inclusion will be merely ordinary, not remarkable. And that is what a true system of justice looks like, where inclusion of all groups is not remarkable, where nothing holds you back but your own individual ability. Thank you.